The Lord be with you, and also with you. Hi, I'm Rev. Joel Talbert of the Presbyterian Church of Chestertown, and we are so honored to welcome you here tonight uh, to this Maundy Thursday worship service. Along with Reverend Caitlin and Kate and others, we've done our best to recreate a beautiful worship service for you in this holy week. I'm walking through the garden towards the sanctuary tonight for you because we remember a long time ago in this same week, Jesus walked through a garden on his way to an upper room with his disciples, on his way to Pilate's house, on his way to Golgotha. It's a tough journey for him to make. Tonight we're going to do our best to take it with him. And remember, without this night, Easter would mean nothing. But through this night, Easter means everything. This weekend will be a beautiful celebration of Easter, even if we can't be together. We'll have the cross out in front of the doors by the parking lot for everyone to drive up and place some flowers on. Do me a favor, though. Don't leave flowers for others to place. And if you find yourself arriving at the same time as someone else, wait till they're finished and then go up and place your flowers on there as well. Whoever you are, if you happen to be joining with us tonight, we hope you find yourself warmly welcomed and greeted and hosted into the hospitality of God here tonight. This is a very special service in the life of the church, and I hope you let it sink in and soak in and remind you that death happens for all of us, but it doesn't get the last word. Let's go to worship, shall we? Join me now in our call to worship. Little children, I am with you only a little longer, Jesus says. We come to draw near to our Lord, to dwell in the gathering darkness, to remember and to grieve. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another, Jesus says. We gather to feast at the table of grace, 
to kneel at the feet of our friends, to learn the way of sacrifice and service. Jesus' hour has come to depart from this world. Our hour has come to wait, to watch, and to pray. Let us worship the one who loves us to the end. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, praise and honor to the one who raised Lazarus from the dead as a foreshadow of the coming days. Blessings and honor to the one who marched triumphantly into Jerusalem, who turned over the tables in the temple, who taught his disciples to be the least of these. Glory and power to the one who submitted to the will of the Father, who broke bread with the one who would betray, who washed the feet of the one who would deny, who healed the ear of the one who would arrest, and in his faithfulness will win victory over sin and death. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 17 through 22. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening had come, he was reclining at table with the twelve disciples. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. Today I'm going to be reading to you out of the Schofield Reference Bible, which was incidentally given to my 91-year-old father on his 21st birthday um, by his parents. Today I'll be reading Matthew 26, verses 26 through 31. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, This is my body. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many of the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, 
All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Lord's table. We are gathered in our own little upper rooms all over the eastern shore and who knows, around the country and around the world this evening together. I encourage you, if you haven't already, pause the video for a moment and go get yourselves something that you can use as communion element out of your pantry or fridge. Find some kind of piece of bread. Find some kind of juice or wine that you could use. And you and your family prepare those communion elements there in your own home. This table, we speak of it all the time, as stretching north, south, east, and west, stretching backwards through all of time and forwards through all of time to include all the saints. So I want you to feel encouraged and empowered to use whatever you have to participate in this sacrament with me and with each other and with God this evening. I'll pause a moment while you go make sure you have elements ready for worship. Brothers and sisters, this table is not only for the worthy. It is for those who would betray or deny or doubt him. It is for all the children of God who do not yet fully embrace the coming kingdom of God. We resist it. We are afraid of it. We don't know what it would look like if everything were so just and so loving. But that day is revealed in Jesus the Christ, and it is coming. His breaking of the bread with his disciples that night promised us all, it is coming. We might resist it intentionally or unintentionally, but it is coming. Just like we are gathered around table with bread and cup, he gathered that night with his people. And he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, said, This is my body. It is broken for you. Take, eat, and do this to remember me. In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you, and do this to remember me. Brothers and sisters, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of a risen Lord until he comes and brings his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the abundance of this table. We don't know yet what it really looks like to be fully your disciples without the betrayal, without the denial, without the fear, but we lean into you and we trust your table is still for us even when we stumble and fall. Your grace is still true for us, more true than our mistakes or our sins, and your kingdom is coming. There's nothing we can do to slow it down or to stop it. We might resist it in some ways, but it is still going to show up. Not even death will stop it. Good and gracious God, may the abundance of these tables around which we are gathered tonight feed us in your truth and inspire us to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please, enjoy the bread of life and the cup of salvation and share it with all those you love. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away for a second time and prayed. My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? 
Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant on the, of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen thus? In that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber? with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to the Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now a reading from Matthew 27, verses 11 to 20. Listen again for the word of the Lord. 
Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You might say so. When Jesus had been accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how many accusations they're making against you? But Jesus gave Pilate no answer to this, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly astonished. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to the people, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Because Pilate realized it was only out of jealousy that they had handed Jesus over. When Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a vision about him. Still, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the people to ask for Jesus Barabbas and to have Jesus the Messiah killed. This is the word of the Lord. Just a month ago, Sunday, March 8th, we gathered for worship here. There were rumors on the horizon. I was doing elbow bumps at the back of the sanctuary instead of handshakes, but that Sunday felt almost normal. We were all allowed here. Many of us were here. There was coffee. There were snacks on the fellowship table. We stood at normal distances from one another, we shared stories and laughter and even some hugs. There were no face masks. When we parted that day, we weren't yet at the point of seeing the reality of the pandemic all around us because seeing it would change everything. This night long ago, when Jesus and his disciples were in that upper room, they sensed something might be coming over the horizon. Jesus had been imagining it for them. He had been warning them about its possibility, what might happen to him, what the disciples and the priests and the government and the people might do to him, but the disciples couldn't see it. They didn't want to see it. They didn't want to believe it could happen. They didn't want to believe they might play a role in helping it happen. Now, sometimes Jesus' arrest and crucifixion are talked about as if it was all part of God's plan, as if God designed it this way and made it happen this way, as if God was puppeteering everyone on the stage, making the words and the actions happen in Peter and Pilate and the priests and the people, just like God wanted. I try to resist that kind of language about God's plan. See, I believe God has a plan. Jesus speaks about it often. It, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom, that new way of doing community is God's plan. And it is coming. And in who Jesus is and in what Jesus did, that community has been revealed, and it's already true somehow, even if it's not yet fully true here and now on earth as it is in the heavens. But I don't believe every little word and action we take part in and take part of are God's plan. In fact, many of our words and actions resist God's plan, resist God's kingdom coming on earth. Jesus knew this too. In tonight's readings already, Jesus sensed their weakness. He could imagine them betraying him or denying him. They didn't like to think about that, but he knew it about them. When Jesus pulled aside to pray and asked them to stay awake, they didn't. They slept. When Jesus was still speaking, teaching, praying, one of his own identified him to the authorities. Another betrayed him by pulling out a weapon 
and wielding it against another child of God. There are no weapons in the community of God. Even if it's pulled in self-defense, it's a betrayal of Jesus and the community of God, God's plan. The ones who say they love him the most, they scatter in the community of God. The people who love God don't run away from God, but run toward God. The community of God, the kingdom of heaven, that's God's plan. Yet all these words and actions so far, they don't look very much like that. Pilate, the one we sometimes blame for crucifying Jesus, he understands the jealousy in the other religious leaders. Jesus has been teaching the scriptures differently and they don't like it. Jesus is lifting up the lowest and the poorest and lowering the powerful and the wealthy and they don't like it. Jesus is granting God's grace without any temple strings attached and they don't like it. Now in God's plan, the kingdom of heaven, the community of God, that kind of jealousy and greed and betrayal, it doesn't happen. So this isn't God's plan. Pilate tries going around the religious leaders. He offers the people an easy way for Jesus to continue God's plan, but the people believe the manipulated stories of their religious leaders. They get afraid. They get all riled up. They, they ask for Barabbas instead, and then they demand Jesus of Nazareth be crucified. In God's plan, in the community of God, there are no lies there. There's no spin. There's no manipulation. There's no crucifixion. There's no worry about power and money and control. This, this isn't God's plan. It wasn't God who did this. The disciples did it. They didn't want to believe it could happen, and they didn't like thinking that they might help it happen. But the disciples helped crucify Jesus, not God. Pilate had the power to derail it, to, to stop it, but he didn't use it. Pilate helped crucify Jesus, not God. The religious leaders, they slandered Jesus and stirred up the crowds. They crucified Jesus, not God. And the people, they went along with all of it. Jesus being in town was causing trouble and they just wanted things to go back to normal. If sacrificing this one man meant things could go back to normal again, then yes, crucify Jesus. The people did that, not God. Imagine with me for a moment that the disciples had stayed true to Jesus. Imagine if Pilate had used his political power to protect Jesus on behalf of the poorest and the sickest and the immigrants. Imagine if the religious leaders had read the scriptures through Jesus' eyes and stopped protecting their temple and their idol but led others to worship and service of God's beloved community. Or imagine if just the people, if the people had said no, no to the weakness of their political leaders, no to the jealous judgments of their religious leaders, and had said yes, we want Jesus of Nazareth. We want our city and our nation. We want every city and every nation to look like the place Jesus keeps calling the kingdom of heaven, where the sick are healed, where the hungry are fed, where the mourning are comforted, where the oppressed are lifted up and the shackled are freed. When we come out of this pandemic, I pray we do not go back to normal. Instead, I pray we really see. I pray we see the ways we, the people, we, the religious leaders, we, the believers and followers of Christ, and 
and we the political leaders, I pray we all see the reality of the pandemic of injustice and jealousy and greed and lies around us. Those things are not God's plan. Those things are our plan. They continue to resist God's community of love and justice and healing and wholeness becoming true for all God's children. So I pray that we see and we let our seeing change everything. And we go work and help to make everything look more and more like God's plan, God's kingdom, the great beloved community of God. To this God and for this kingdom be all glory and honor now and forevermore. Amen. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. A reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 33 through 44. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. 
Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. A reading from Matthew 27, verses 45 through 54. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Heli, Heli, Lamach Shavaktani, which means, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God.
from Matthew 27, 55 to 60. Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They'd followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Brothers and sisters, as we go into the night, May we see the ways we resist God's coming kingdom and pray for the courage and strength and integrity to help God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven for all God's children.